Welcome to the Asking Why podcast. I'm your host, Clint Davis, and we have with us today Nellie Harden, and we're on episode 95. Um, Nellie Harden is a wife, a mom, and a dreamer that comes from a diverse background, including marine science, behavior, and family wellness. She decided years ago that living a life designed by purpose and for freedom was how she and her husband, along with their four daughters, goodness, want to live. Today, she is a family life and leadership coach, helping parents eliminate power struggles with their daughters and grow in confidence wiseness and respectful young women that are actually ready for the world she believes that a family filled with creative creativity fun laughter challenge adventure problem solving hugs good food and learning can only change a person's life but is the best chance at positive changing the world um so welcome to the podcast super excited to, to talk to you nelly and just hear what you have going on i have two boys so um i'm interested to hear the differences and the funness of racing four girls it is very different but thank you so much for having me on the show absolutely well tell me kind of your story how'd you get to being a coach and and how'd you get where you're at Oh, it's a long convoluted, you know, 44 year (laughs) story. But um, we, I mean, just to put it in simple perspectives, I, uh, when I grew up, my dad passed away when I was super young. I was only, um, I was nine months old when he was in an accident. He passed away when I was one and a half. And then it was just my mom and I for a while. And uh, she was remarried and I had a brother and sister from there. So that was a different, uh, you know, it was different from many of my friends that I had growing up and what that looked like. And it made me face some things much earlier in my life that some other people just hadn't had to face or think of or do. Um, and so I've always kind of, I, you know, when I was a kid, I was the one that liked to hang out with adults uh, more than hang out with my, uh, my peers. And, um, but when I left to go to, to school. I left home at 17 to go off to college. Uh, looking back, and I, I wouldn't have told you at the time, I didn't have the tools to understand at the time, but I really didn't have that you know, foundation of worth, esteem, and confidence that was going to take me into that next step of life. And in doing that and going off into life with that perspective, and I was seven hours away from home, um, I really left and was chase. If you don't go in with that, per- with that foundation, then you're busy chasing it and you don't know how to gather it. And mm-hmm. so I was busy, especially my freshman year, just chasing worth everywhere I could find it. And when that is your only goal, because you don't know what else to do, it leads you down some pretty rough roads, especially as a young woman. And so that was kind of my personal story with it. And then I've had to grow and mature and build these foundations in my adulthood, which is much harder to do, by the way, just because of the way our brains develop. It's much easier to do this within what I call the 6570. That's how many days are in 18 years. Mm. And so if we can build this within the 6570, then it is much more foundational than so many of the adults that are trying to do it now. And then going further on, I have four daughters now. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So, and I had four daughters within four and a half years following three years of infertility. Oh my goodness. And so, you know, we the pendulum swung one way and then the pendulum swung way the other way. And then it was my husband who was in ICU when I had four kids, four and under, and we didn't know if he was going to make it. Mm. And things just really came, became very, very clear of what do we want? What do we want this life to look like? And how do we not want to waste any of it just by, you know, going with the flow, so to speak? What do we really want? And how can we set these girls up for success in their lives? And Throughout that, that's really where things were born. My background is in biology and psychology. I love to know how, you know, the mechanics of things, but then how that manifests in be- in behavior and change and thoughts, et cetera. And so, but I was working in the animal world. I, I worked in the wild with humpbacks and um, other marine mammals. Then I worked in captivity. And when I retired from all of that, it was less than a year before my husband went into ICU for the first time. And so, uh, and he's still here today. He's doing great. Um, But it really made me take everything that I had learned and known and understood and developed and then apply it from the much more black and white animal world 
uh, to the much more messy human world. <laughs> yeah. And it started with my family and then it grew. And then I was really just called to get out there and help families with uh, practicing positive disciplines, which then, you know, rolled into understanding worth, esteem and confidence, especially for all of our kids. And because of my unique situation, young women out in the world today. So that is a, you know, a 35,000 foot view of how I kind of got yeah. here. And my life has just been building to where, where I am and what I'm doing today. Yeah, that's awesome. So you basically, you, you had this loss early on, then you kind of grew up as a teen girl yourself, obviously. And then as you became an adult, how did, how did your faith or what played in what kind of, you know, kind of faith dynamic played into all of that? How did that shape you? So we did not, I, my husband and I are both, uh, really first generation Christian homes that we're, um, growing into right now. So Faith, when I was young, there was uh, some mishaps and, and issues when my dad had passed away that really made my mom, you know, walk away from faith some. And we didn't, in my family, we really didn't practice any. Um, and it was just, an, you know, there was Christmas, of course, but it was all about gifts, right? Yeah. And there was Easter, but it was Creaster. all about the egg hunts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, you know, we really didn't go to church. There was a brief time that I was sent randomly uh, during the Gulf War in the early 90s. I was in middle school and my dad, who was my stepdad, but I called him dad. And he was like, you got to go to church and get your first communion. And I was like, I don't know what that is. And where am I doing? What am I? I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. I did that. And then we never went back again. So I don't know what that was about. It was to get my stamp, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. And, um, and well, you start thinking husband, about, you know, you start thinking about eternity and you start thinking about, yes. um, you know, life and, and death whenever there's a war and where there's a crisis. And and that's, a you know, obviously can be a good thing. But um, if not, in my opinion, not inside relationship or for the right purpose, it just fizzles out. Right. It's like a bottle rocket. Exactly. And it was honestly humiliating for me at the time because I was in eighth grade and I was doing first communion with a bunch of first graders. And so it was it was not a good experience mm, for me. And I it was just a learn and regurgitate for the catechism, you know, type of exam. And then my husband was uh, kind of the same way, did not grow up in a um, uh, Christian practicing home. And it was, they'll figure that out later. I'm not going to give them any ground rules now type of mentality. So, so that's not much what we discipleship. Had. Right. No, yeah. no, no, no. But not much. I mean, hardly any. What yes. would you say if you look back on kind of those years up until becoming an adult looking back? Right. So one of the questions I have for people a lot in my life and in general and from people is like, OK, so, you know, you didn't get discipled. You weren't following Christ. You weren't being led. You weren't being modeled. It wasn't it wasn't being taught. You weren't seeing Jesus on a daily basis. You weren't seeing these things played out. So why didn't you, what are the outliers, what are the relationships, what are the things in your life that allowed for you to become a successful person versus someone who also didn't have that and ended up going way down the deep end, right? I mean, all behaviors, mm -hmm. you know, behavior and none are better than the others, but what do you think kept you or, you know, as close to, you know, survivable as possible, I guess? Um. So for me, and it, it was just, you know, it, I look back and I just see God's timing and all of it. And, but for me, I didn't grow up with that, but because I lost my dad so early in my life, I always felt like there was something I knew, like it wasn't just gone. Right. Mm -hmm. I knew he wasn't just gone. And so I talked with my dad a lot, even though, like I said, he, he was in an accident when I was nine months old. So there wasn't a lot of time that we had together, certainly not in my conscious memory. Mm -hmm. um, but I talked with him a lot and there was always just this thing that I knew was out there, but I, I was like, yeah, that's cool. You're out there, but I'm not going to recognize you or really give you any notice. And I went to, I love serving people. And so when I was in high school, the way that I could serve was through a youth group. Mm. And even though when all of, you know, that stuff quote unquote came up, I was like, okay, okay. But just serving people really helped me open those doors for myself. My husband on the other hand didn't. And so my husband came to faith. Uh, we were in, um, uh, gosh, this was in 2010. And 2010, my husband had heart surgery. We almost lost my daughter in a drowning accident. 
It was a hard, hard year. All of that happened within a couple of months. Well, he was debating at work, unbeknownst to me, with a friend of his. Um, he was debating against the Bible. And he, uh, someone told him, um, they would go back and forth. And he said, you know what? I don't know any more than what I've already said. So why don't I read uh, read some of this, you know, great book, you know, you supposedly have. And I'll get back to you so we can debate more on this. And Angela, who's a friend of ours, who was the one talking to him, said, great, I'll like, here you go. <laughs> and so then um, he read through, you know, uh, Matthew, Mark, and he was getting through Luke. And he went over to her desk and said, never mind, you're right. I, I take back everything I said. You're completely right. So he had such a change of heart. I had no idea any of this was happening. And so then he comes home from work. It was uh, fall of t uh, 2010, and we had been through all of these things that year. And he's like, I think we should start saying this grace thing before we eat and maybe look into churches around the area. We lived in an area with a lot of really big churches. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. And so we just did. And, and you were we living where it. at the time? Uh, we were in Indianapolis okay. at the time. And so uh, I said, okay. And... It was kind of a relief of I'm finally opening the door of this thing that I've been kind of ignoring for a while, but I also have no idea what's on the other side of that door. So yeah. let's let's see. Right. And we went and it was Christmas service was our first service at this very large church called Northview in Indianapolis. Um, and I'm telling you, as soon as worship started, like it, the scales fell off for both of us simultaneously. Wow. And it was just a beautiful thing. And we have been, you know, head over heels and, you know, neck deep ever since. That's and, a uh, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it's, <laughs> it's interesting, you know, the different testimonies that people have and their experiences, you know, for the unchurched, a lot of times that's what it is, right? I mean, when you haven't seen it and then you experience the Holy Spirit, you know, and you experience these moments and you're just like, God opens you up to him and there's mm -hmm. this connection and there's this peace. And it's kind of the silver bullet moment for people. And for a lot of people who have been, you know, heavily churched, you know, they go to church Wednesday and Sunday and they're at the youth groups and they're at the things their whole life, but their parents aren't modeling Christ. It's almost more, I tend to see more of a slow fade in that. Like there's a, there's a moment that there's, there's this thing, they know it's real. I believe probably they're, they're even have salvation, but their sanctification process looks a lot differently. And there's all these little big moments where the Holy Spirit continues to come in and shape and shape and shape. And again, not that that doesn't happen for people who have the, it continues for everybody, right? But it's just an interesting dynamic of um, the culture we're in where very few people are just being discipled well, right? And so they walk into the faith and they have these moments. And, and I don't know if that's how you feel with your own kids, but there's this tension of, for me and my boys, where I'm like, I look at them and I'm like, okay, we talk about Jesus every day. We integrate Jesus and scripture every day. I'm constantly telling them about God and about who he is. And, and they see that in our lives and how we talk and what we do and what we watch and all the things. And we don't just like go to church and expect the church to do it. Um, however, both of my boys need to find humility and have, and they're going to have to have this moment where they're so desperate for Jesus and so desperate for salvation and so desperate to repent and heal and what's going to take that is, you know, probably a little bit of pain. And so it's yeah. this, the world's going to give that to, to them at some point. But it's like, man, it's just such a tension. I don't know if you find that, but I tend to find that tension of like, you know, you pray for that. And at the same time, you're like, I don't want you to suffer at all. <laughs> you know? Yes, 100 percent. And, you know, I've. I think it's part of the gift of why I didn't come to salva or salvation as late because I've had 30 plus years without it and I've had, you know, 10, you know, 12 years with it now. And it is, you know, as different as black and white. And we talk about that a lot with our kids and our kids see that a lot out in the world and, and, you know, with other people as well, like, wow, you know, that's that. And, but they've grown up here in the, in the church for, you know, the majority of it. I think there were five, my oldest was five when we started. And I remember when we started and <clears throat> this is a young woman, my oldest, she's going off to college um, in the fall. And she started reading like Charlotte's web when she was uh, right before her third birthday. So she's always been a high thinker. And so when we were five or when she was five and we started um, driving into the church one Sunday and she said, I just feel like it's home. Mm. 
Mm. I was like, oh, that, you know, wow, that is yes, just yes, right? Right. And, but we've had so many things that have happened in our lives that I can look back on even before we recognized God and definitely afterwards that there's no other explanation other than that. My husband uh, um, was, he had cardiac issues. That was why he was in ICU. And he had this incredible dream where he was sitting talking with Paul on the seashore. And he doesn't remember exactly what they were talking about, but he remembers there was like a lot of in-depth discussion and decisions that were being made. My husband woke up that morning with a handprint upside down on his chest over his heart. And it was bigger than my hand. And it wouldn't have been physically possible for my husband to lay that way without breaking his wrist. And so it was like upside down here and it stayed there for like 15 hours. So it wasn't like, you know, when you cross your legs or whatever, you get a little red mark. It stayed there for hours. We, you know, got our pastor involved because we were like, what is happening right now? You know? And, you know, I think about that now and I'm like, maybe it was a decision, like, something had to happen for him to be able to stay here because his heart was so weak and you know things like that and our baptism stories so our kids have heard these and now they're 18 15 15 and 13 and especially our older three are really starting to get to the point of recognizing and holding on to their own faith especially my 18 year old my 15 year olds um twins are are definitely getting there as well my 13 year old is 13 so she will get there i have confidence but one of the most important things i think as parents that we need to do is help our kids own their own faith before they leave home Mm -hmm. they cannot leave home just with the um you know holding on to the you know, cape of our faith, right? Because we're going to separate. There's going to be, uh, you know, geographical uh, separation. There's also going to be independence in there. And if they leave home without owning their own faith, then that is really going to contribute to their loss of their worth, Mm -hmm. their esteem, and their confidence out in the world. That's good. So, um, so what are some, what are some ways that you've kind of curated that, or you guys have curated that, um, to get to a point where 15 and 18 year olds are starting to own their own and, and feel confident in that? Well, I think part of it, and you you brought this up too, is the world is going to give them pain. And my kids are not, uh, certainly not immune and certainly not, um, you know, uh, foreign to what pain looks like in relationships and friendships are so hard, much harder today, I feel like because Oof. of, you know, social media and all of that, right? So friendships, uh, rejection, and all of these things. So helping them find uh, the five keys of worth. So those five keys of worth are to be seen and to be heard and to be loved and to belong and have a purpose. And so when you really, and you know, I look at this foundation that we build of worth, esteem, and confidence, like a three-tiered cake that's really big and it keeps them away from the you know hot lava of the world around them because they're built on this foundation and it's right at the cornerstone this foundation has a specific address it's right at the cornerstone of understanding their biology right their bodies their brains um their psychology their personality you know who who they are who they're trying to become their faith Uh, certainly, and then understanding the culture around them and that they are, uh, you know, witnessing culture, they can influence culture, but they are not of culture, Mm -hmm. right? So this foundation, this exact foundation at this exact address, but the foundation looks different for everybody, right? Because if you break down, like, let's just say, uh, you know, a teenager wants to be seen, right? Well, the opposite of that is that they're invisible. And you look at the opposite of all of those, it's going to be why we're seeing so many mel- mental health crises today, right? They're invisible, they're ignored, they're unloved, they're rejected, and they have no purpose or reason. Mm-hmm. That's w- that's where a lot of our mental health struggles are coming from today because they're believing those lies, and we all know where lies, you know, yep. are coming from. Yeah. And so. Oh, go ahead. <clears throat> 
<laughs> and so if we can really instill in them how to find these five pillars of worth through God, through self, and then also through others, because we want them to build beautiful relationships with people here on earth as well, right? But in that order, God, self, and others, then they will be able to establish those worth pillars much, much more in their lives. That's awesome. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, I'm trained in what's called restoration therapy. I don't know if you've ever heard of Terry and Sharon Hargrave, but, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah, yeah. so their, their, their principles are similar. It's, you know, their two core things are love and trust, you know, mm -hmm. that have to be the primary thing. And love is, am I worthy? Am I seen? Am I known? Am I special? Am I unique? And trust is, am I safe? Is the world safe? Are relationships safe? And it's the same thing. You know, how do you repair that? You repair that by first understanding your beliefs, shape your thoughts and feelings, which shape your actions. And I think that's another thing that our world is stuck in, and, and I write about this and talk about this a lot, is just the behavior modification focus, whether it's psychology or church or culture. It's like everybody's looking at what these kids can produce and how they can function in the world and what quote-unquote success looks like. But nobody's – very few people are getting down to what are, What do you believe? Like what are you standing right. on and, and who do you think you are? Not – and. But that paradigm is not, again, what do you produce and who you are isn't what you produce or what you look like or how you, you know, play in the world. Your identity is who God says you are. And and right. and experiencing that, much like you and I story, like I didn't experience that growing up. Of course my parents tried to love me and they cared about me and, you know, all those things, but experiencing a real discipleship model where um, there's layers upon layers of experience where it's like, no, your identity is in Christ. Here's who Christ thinks you are. Oh, you got rejected. Oh, you got bullied. Oh, you got beat up. Oh, you experienced trauma. Well, I'm right here to walk with you through that and show you through my behaviors and actions, the love of God and the love of Christ. So it's not just a concept. It's an experience. Right. So I love 100%. what you're hundred percent. I love what you're saying. I mean, I, I also, I love the, you know, the body, brain, faith, um, culture, and then identity crossroads thing you're so right like it's all of that together yeah and you know i have this uh great venn diagram uh i'm such a visual person right yeah. and you put those together <clears throat> and it's like well many of our teenagers and especially our young women are going out there and they just have you know their they know their body maybe and they know culture Mm -hmm. That is one of the most dangerous places to be for a young woman today, because then they know that they are going out there and this is what I have to offer, but that isn't what they have to offer, mm -hmm. right? But that's what culture is telling them that they have to offer. So they're un very unsafe in that way. And they become prey in a lot of ways to themselves, to their future, to other people. Um, so it can be very dangerous. And then you think about those people that, okay, I, I know myself and maybe I know my, you know, my body a little bit. Most people don't understand their brains and that's a, you know, whole other conversation and this beautiful and unique way our brains are, are, uh, created and parts of us are protected and parts of us are used at different times during brain development in the first 25 years. But you know, they know these three things, but they aren't grounded in their faith. So they don't have that compass that they can be like, okay, wait, this is where I am. And that's where you get a lot of these kids that are like, oh, I have to go, you know, quote unquote, find myself. I have to discover who I am and all of this. And that's, you know, a bunch of baloney. You develop who you are becoming yeah. out there. You know, it's not like I, I often say it's not like a you know field of daisies and you go out there and you're like, oh, I have to go find which one is me. No, you, yeah, you sit there find and yourself, say, right? right, I'm an oak tree and this is who I am, right? And so that's a paradigm shift that really needs to happen. But it's very difficult. And in fact, I would say almost impossible to happen on a wide scale. That's why I work in, you know, true change is one living room at a time. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I think <clears throat> uh, you can, you know, agree or disagree. But I think one of the other parts is just the, the radical individualism of parenting and culture now, you know, mm -hmm. by the grace of God, you know, some of us have, God's awoken us and the Holy Spirit stepped in and, and brought healing and brought restoration and is still doing that work, obviously, in our lives. And it, it made us aware of these things. But so many people are stuck in their trauma and in their own shame and in their own lack of identity and purpose as a parent and are either trying to run so hard from not being their parents or they're just, you know, kind of doing the only thing they know, which is what their parents did. And that leaves a lot to be... Uh, 
to be desired when it comes to you know parenting kids in the world that we live in now where they're constantly being attacked by identity and they're constantly being told you know trust your gut find yourself you know all these kind of like catchphrases that people use um when in reality we as parents are supposed to be helping them form that identity by the way we treat them and what, how we speak into their life and we get so busy and so chaotic and so overwhelmed with our own pain that we can't even you know see our kids pain and i think a lot of yes. parents are unfortunately in that situation. Um, one of the things you, you talk about the, that I read was just kind of having difficult conversations when there is crisis. So what are some, what are some experiences you have, or what are some ways that you kind of in the culture now with these teen girls now, I mean, you're, you're literally living it out. What are some things that maybe are new that, you know, parents are dealing with that you don't see talked about enough that are hard conversations, one that need to be had. And two, how do you have those in the text, everything, uh, you know, focused world. Yeah. Well, one of the things I would say is today our kids are growing up thinking everyone has to like them, Mm. right? Everyone has to like them for everything. And so when that doesn't happen, because it absolutely will, you know, that shoe will drop, I promise you. (laughs) Um, And so then when it does, they're so surprised. They're like, well, why don't they like me? What did I do wrong? Why, when I put this post out there, does it not get, you know, that many likes? Or why, when I walk into a room, they huddle around. We recently had a situation with um, a couple of my girls that they were being not only emotionally and mentally rejected from a friend group, but they are being physically rejected. Like they walk in and the the uh, group closes off, right? Mm-hmm. And doesn't allow them in. <clears throat> and that was really hard for them, especially considering these were quote unquote church friends, right? They were people that they know from church. And so just really having these discussions and I've had to do this. So I've had to mentor because I'm a youth leader and I mentor in the community and I've had to mentor a good handful of kids now that have hurt my own children. Mm -hmm. And so I get a question very often of, how do you possibly do that, right? I was talking to a relative recently and they were like, I would just yell at them and, and reject them and, and you know ignore them and do all the things. And I was like, here's the thing, they're going through something and they're going through something hard and I may or may not know what that is, but I know that they're going through something because everyone has a story, right? We all know hurt people hurt people, whether you want to admit it or not, hurt people hurt people. And so who would I be as a child of Christ, as a mom, as a leader in the community, uh, you know, a trusted leader in the community, who would I be if I, you know, I have one view of the story that you hurt my kid. And so I'm going to go and I'm just going to exponentiate and turn up the volume Mm -hmm. on this, you know, this train of, of negativity. I said, so I I recently had a situation where there was a student that came up to me that had hurt one of my kids and she apologized to me and she's, it was so sincere and so sweet and beautiful. And, and she just said, you know, I know as a mom that it must be really hard to have your child hurt. And I'm just really sorry for any part of that, that I had. And we just hugged and cried for a while and people were passing us, you know, and they were like, Oh my goodness. You know, you know, the rumor mill, like what's going on there and all this stuff. And, but it was a beautiful moment for us. And then we were able to heal. And then taking that back and showing that courage to my kids. And it doesn't mean that everything is hunky dory by any means, but you just need to understand people and we're all coming out of a story and you don't know what that person is. So their outside actions do not necessarily reflect their inside feelings, Mm -hmm. right? It just might be the, it can be their leftovers. It could be what they can show, right? Because maybe they're too embarrassed. Maybe they're too shameful to actually show what's happening on the inside or too confused, right? And so resulting behaviors, and I've had to have so many talks with my kids about this, about peers that they see, right? Resulting behaviors, that is the end result of a very long, uh, you know, a chain of events that are happening in a person. So, you know, you take that back to, okay, if they, if they spoke this or did this, then there was a decision to do that. And before the decision, there was a feeling. And before the feeling, there was a thought. And then before that, there was where did that thought come from? Mm -hmm. There's a belief. And so, yeah. 
And <clears throat> so we talk about, and I have a, a, a cycle called the HALT cycle, and it's his or her, depending on who I'm talking to, aligned life thoughts. So you want to align your thoughts, your feelings, your decisions, and your behaviors in line with accountability, inner accountability. Who is that that you're talking to? I highly recommend Jesus, right? Um, and then outer, or I'm sorry, inner accountability. What is your value system, right? It's like your, your, your safety fence around you. You know, mine are faith, integrity, and wisdom personally. And so I know that if I had a thought come into my head, I've checked it, you know, is this okay to have, right? With that outside counsel and then come in and say, does this actually penetrate through the fence of faith, integrity, and wisdom? And if it doesn't, then I just let it go. And I, I don't hold on to that anymore. And if it does, then I get to a point that I'm like, okay, if I do this, if I make the decision to do this, and mind you, all of this is happening in milliseconds sometimes, mm -hmm. right? But if I make the decision to do this, is this putting uh, moving me toward who I am trying to become? Or is it moving me further away from that? Right? Yep. And teaching our kids this cycle over and over again. And that's the natural progression of a thought, you know, going from a thought to an action anyway. So using it intentionally in order to get you closer to who you are trying to become is a tool that they can use over and over again, especially while their frontal lobe, which is right under your forehead, is still very much under construction. And that's where critical thinking happens. And, you know, it would be the difference between telling your kid to, you know, did you think about that? You know, why didn't you think harder about that? Well, they don't have the the tools and mechanisms to do that yet versus giving them, okay, who's your inner account or your outside accountability? What's your inner accountability and your values? What, who are you trying to become? And let's make sure that you're following that and going mm -hmm. through there. So just solid tools that they can use and explaining to my kids, not everybody has those tools or knows how to use them yet. And so we have to have grace. Yeah. We have to have so much grace in this world. Absolutely. A couple of things you said that were great thoughts. You know, it's, it's interesting from a, a religious or a Christian perspective. Uh, you know, I say people are selectively spiritual. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is, um, you know, I think Jesus was able to love on people and connect with people because he saw people holistically, the mind, body, spirit, the, their whole thing, right? He knew what was going on with their neuropathways pathways and their connections and how they think and what they need to hear and how they need to hear it. Excuse me. He also knew, you know, how their bodies work, how their minds work. And then he knew the spiritual warfare going on. And it's interesting, the church sometimes, or maybe Western America, um, you know, we're kind of meat machines. We're, uh, we're looking at behaviors and don't drink and don't cuss and don't lose your temper and don't watch porn and don't do these things. And, and again, those things are not healthy and you know you shouldn't do it because it's not good for you and not good for other people. However, the primary focus in education is, you know, behavior modification, read your Bible, pray, um, and then don't do these things. And there's the spiritual side of, well, how do you connect with the Holy Spirit? And how does the Holy Spirit dwell in you and speak truth to you? And how does the Holy Spirit work out of you to give you love, patience, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control? You know, these things. It's kind of like over here on the side, not a heavy focus. While at the same time, the, the spiritual side, the... Um, all of this is, you know, your salvation is on the line. And if you don't do these things, there's this kind of spiritual element of hell and, and condemnation. It's just this kind of inconsistent battle where in reality, you have to take both of them together and go, okay, you as a kid need to understand your biology church. Like you can't, if you don't, you're not, if you don't understand neuroscience and you don't understand like how a three-year-old develops, then how are you going to know how to appropriately discipline them, right? And guide them exactly. and shape them. If you have a 15-year-old and you think they should logically be able to respond to you and think the way, and it's because you don't understand the science. But it's partly like, well, we don't need to understand that because we know the Bible and we have the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, the focus is on the behavior modification and how, and like, don't drink and don't cuss and don't do these things. It's like, well, in order to not do those behaviors, you need to understand how the brain works to help people. So it feels like this like duality of like, I need you to perform behaviorally, but don't understand your body, you know, and be super spiritual, but let's not get weird about spirituality. Does that make <laughs> yeah. sense? Like, yes, it makes like, it's like, sense. oh my gosh, like uh, it just, you know, it, I just thought of it that way while we were, as we we're talking in a, in a different context. And then the other thing you said um, was 
I mean, beautifully said, but I think it just, it, it reminded me of a, like a safety net of discipleship. So where scripture says, parent your children in this way and they won't depart from it, right? It doesn't mean they're not going to sin. It doesn't mean they're not going to run off the rails for a couple months or a couple years. It means they're going to come back to it or they're going to stay connected. And it's like, you take a bullying situation, for example, you know, I can't tell you the amount of times that my boys and I have had the conversation of what so-and-so family member said about us or acted has nothing to do with us. That has something to do with what's going on with them internally. They're sad. They're upset. They don't really know how to communicate that way. Your buddy at school might not have healthy parents and he might be scared and he might be upset. And, and over the course of nine years so far, and then hopefully the next you know decade, by the time they're dealing with something at 15, where uh, like in your situation where somebody really bullies them or isolates them, you have this safety net of discipleship that you can trust that you can show that that bully grace and love because you're not so concerned about the protection of your child. And I don't mean you're not concerned about the protection of your child, but you've built this net where you're like, I know they can handle themselves. I know they're not going to fall apart. It may be hurtful. They may really, you know, it, and they should hurt and grieve that someone's bullying them and someone's ostracizing them. And that's super painful. But you're not in a fight or flight response because, because you're able to go, I, I, they know I've told them this, I've prepared them for this. They're not they're They don't like it, but they're not necessarily surprised by it. And mm -hmm. so your kid's not like, maybe they have an instinct to be like, why are you being nice to them for a second? But they've seen you do it before. They've experienced grace. They've experienced restoration and reconciliation. So they're like, I don't like this. You know, my flesh says to do this, but of course my mom's going to reconcile with them. Of course my dad's going to go over and love on them. That kid's hurting. It's not the right. first, it can't be the first time in their life at 15 and 16 that there's a conversation about why other people behave a certain way. Does that make exactly. sense? And yes, I think that's what exactly. we missed was like, and what we're missing as a society is getting past the behavioral symptoms and getting to these root causes in psychology and also theology. Yeah. So I love, I loved how you put it. I mean, it's right in line with all the things that we talk about here all the time. So it's beautiful. I mean, beautifully said. And, and I think we'll hopefully connect some dots for people to see like, you know, this is why, you know, don't just people are like, you need more Jesus. It's like, what does that mean? You know what I mean? Like, how do yes. you actually need more Jesus? Yes. And that's, you know, a part of our youth groups too. And like you were saying, and I've had so many talks with my girls, you know, we go to youth group or we, we go to different programs and things and they're like, everything will be solved. You just need to get in the Bible every day. You just need to get in the Bible every day. And I see their point, but also then we're totally disregarding what they're facing in the school hallways, right? And the questions that they're being asked or the questions that they're facing or the questions that are making them question themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that cultural piece there. And faith, there are disciplines absolutely that we need to do, but how do they actually play in? Like, why should we, you know, go and read the Bible? Yep. Why should we pray? And, you know, does praying, I, last week I was coaching someone through praying uh, because uh, she was praying out loud and she's like, I'm no good at this. I was like, there's literally no such thing as being no good at praying. It's just like, hey, God, hope you're having, you know, I, I, I hope that, you know, we're serving you today. Please give us wisdom and fill our hearts and show us what we can do for you. Like, amen. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no bad way that you can just have a conversation with God. It's good. And I mean, but you that, look at David and he did it all the ways. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like ways. that's why he was a man after God's own heart is because he literally yelled, screamed, cried, lamented, thankful, you know, all the things to God. And that's what God wants from us. He just wants us to give him all the conversations and all the feelings and all the emotions. And yeah, that's prayer. So we just, my oldest, uh, we go on one-on-one -on -one trips with our kids before they leave the 6570. And so I just went to a, a wellness retreat center with my oldest daughter um, last weekend, actually. And tying that in, I think one of the biggest things that we can do with them, uh, with our kids is teaching discernment, right? Mm -hmm. We have to be able to teach discernment. So we go to this wellness retreat center less than 24 hours after we just came from a Christian youth camp where it was like high worship, high energy, you know, high, all of this. And now we're at this retreat center and the retreat center was not a Christian retreat center, but, and there was definitely a lot of, you know, like, um, 
because it was uh, some meditation, which I totally think that you can sit and have Christian meditation yeah. and prayer and, and do these things. But, I know what you mean from a, from more of a, yes. like, you know, uh, you know, crystals and worldview and like, you know, from the wrong yes. route. Yeah. Right. And so new, um, new age. we were, Yes. And so we were there and it was, um, there was like this drum circle that was happening there. And I, and we were both musical people. We're like, Hey, we love drums. Let's go see what it's like. And I, I was like, well, you know, we just need to be cautious, you know, of whatever we're saying or doing in there. Right. So we knew that going in and right at the top of the page of this music sheet that we got, it said on there in bold letters, it's not important that you understand the words that you are saying. Uh, it's just important that we sing them and we're in harmony, whatever. And I was like, red flag right uh -huh. there. Like it's, <laughs> and so, you know, it was, and we sat there. And so I just really prayed going in. I was like, Holy spirit, just guide me. Like if I need to leave, let me know to leave. If I need to do something, just let me know. And when I was sitting there, right next to my daughter, I could listen to it. And it was beautiful singing. It was gorgeous. It was in, um, it was in ancient, uh, 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 what you call it, language. So I didn't understand any of it, but it was beautiful to listen to. But as soon as I tried to participate in anything, and again, going into it with Holy Spirit guide me, as soon as I started to participate, it was like, nope, I was like, okay. <laughs> and so we were then leaving and my daughter's like, grab that, you know, piece of paper. I want to see what these, you know, words were. So we go back and we're listening to, or we're looking up what these words meant. And it was a lot to like, I don't know, the goddess of bees and the, you know, this or that. And she's like, okay, so we're not going back to that. And so I was just so glad that I could have that experience with her so that she, we got so much out of being at that wellness center, but there was some things that we just left behind and we weren't going to participate in and having that discernment because it's not, you know, all or nothing, right. Especially with this like Hindu or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but we were able to learn how to meditate and have good prayer and be out in nature and do these things. And we were able to leave some of that other stuff behind. So um, it was just a beautiful experience to be there because I know she's going to be bombarded with a lot of more things out in the world to teach her, okay, use the Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit guide you in what to do and what not to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great because they're going to be in the world. And I think that's the tension that we find as parents is how do we, how do we, you know, expose them to things, right? Um, and, and I see this swing all the time. I mean, all the way from like rated R movies or even pornography I've seen in the secular world of like, well, they're going to see it. So, you know, what matter, you know, what's it matter? I'll talk to them about what's real about it. So who cares if they see it? And it's mm -hmm. like, well, that's passing the point of exposure, right? They're, they are going to be exposed to things no matter what. So we need to buffer as much as we can, but we also can't put them in a bubble to where they never experience anything. And we never have you know, these kind of conversations where like, Oh, meditation, let's just run. You know, it's like, well, let's talk about how you can do this in a healthy way. And for the Lord, and let's talk about how this can get twisted up and how this can open the door for, you know, unhealthy things. And so, yeah, I think that again, though, the dynamic is the hope is to be doing that along the way as they're little, right. all the way through high school, all the way into young adulthood. I think part of the difficulty for people is the question of, well, I haven't done any of that, or I came to Christ later in life how do I repair that? And how do I grieve kind of not doing that? Um, and how do I, you know, forgive myself for maybe, you know, missing that with my kids? What would you kind of say to those people listening? They're like, Oh, I feel shame. I feel like I didn't do these things. I, I haven't done that. Is it too late? Right. Well, I never think it's too late, first of all. And secondly, you know, shame because of what happened <clears throat> and things that happened when I was a freshman in college, like I was talking about earlier, way back in my story, I carried shame and guilt and just so much negativity for like 16 years. I carried that until the Lord took it away from me. And it was at a dis uh, discipleship walk that I was on. And I struggled. It was like, you know, the wrestling, you know, I, my hip was probably broken after this. And I, I sit there because the Lord said, I did not mean for you to carry this. It is part of your story, but I did not mean for you to carry this. Right. And I could not look Jesus in the eye and say, you died for nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to carry this anyway. Right. And so I would just say to anyone that's carrying for whatever reason, that guilt and shame 
the Lord is there ready to take your bags, but you have to give them to him or you have to give your bags over to him, right? He won't take your things for you or away from you. You have to be able to relinquish them to him. And so understanding it's part of your story. It's part of your child's story and give yourself grace because if Jesus can give you grace, you certainly can give yourself grace as hard as that is, right? Mm -hmm. So give yourself grace and see how you can use that because anything, the Lord can use anything, any, I have been through some terrible situations in my life. There's always a way that it can be used for good and for the kingdom. And so find out what that is and have a real raw conversation with your child and or your spa and or your spouse or whatever you know whoever needs to be involved in this but have that conversation and be calm be really raw and truthful i i always say uh, relationships are built off of truth and trust right and so be truthful grow that trust there might have been something that you did in there be honest about it and be repentant of it and make the change yeah absolutely i think authenticity as a parent is so so important you don't have to be perfect but you yeah. do have to be real and, and authenticity is, it does breed safety. You know, kids feel yeah. safe when their kids, when their parents will express some things. And, you know, obviously you got to age appropriately with detail and all those things. But, um, sure. I think it is important to, to walk alongside them and share what God's doing in your life and, and what he's restoring. And, and that gives them hope because, you know, we all become parents and adults or we can become adults, some of us parents, and we and we start to have grace and understanding for our own parents. And we're like, oh, man, I was so critical for so many years for these failures. And even though the things they did were not right or unhealthy, you don't you find yourself hopefully having humility and being like, ooh, however, I could I've done some of those similar things or I came close to doing that. And the only reason I didn't was by the grace of God or because of more supports or because of more knowledge or whatever, right? It wasn't, I'm morally superior. I'm above right. that. And I think there's where real freedom comes in as a, as an adult is going, yeah, I got to let that stuff go. I, I got to honor it. I got to process it. I got to do the work, but then I got to let it go and stop letting it eat at me. And, um, I think that's a lot of work that parents need to do so they can love their adult kids. Yeah. I truly think that most people, are doing the best they can with what they have. You know, it it goes back to that foundation. What kind of foundation do they have? You know, do they know that they're worthy? Do they know that, you know, that they have uh, value and appreciation, right? Are, do they believe in themselves? And when you don't have that foundation, so much gets broken down along the way, which then, of course, bleeds out onto everyone around them. So as an adult, looking back at, you know, your parents or, you know, people from your uh, background and saying, gosh, they were doing the best they could with what they had. And I just need to give them grace for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Nellie, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, tell tell us kind of, well, I, I have your handle. So on Facebook, you're at the 6570 Project. Um, mm-hmm. And then they can go to NellieHarden.com and then at Nellie Harden on Instagram. What are some things that the average parent can kind of, resources they can gain from you, support they can gain from you? Absolutely. I will say that my Instagram changed because okay. I was the victim of a hacker hacked. in January that took down everything. And it was so sad. So it's Nelly.a.harden uh, on, on Instagram. Um, but yeah, if you go to my website, you can find everything on there. There's uh, resources that are continuing to grow on there. And then there is a um, daughter decoder masterclass on there and some downloads that you can do as well as, as all of our communities you can find on there. So um yeah, it's just all about helping parents take the lead, right? Take the lead in your child's life. There's a big difference between first and second half of childhood parenting. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, talking about those differences, what you need to bring to the table, but helping parents take the lead so that their kids know how to take the lead of their lives before they leave home. That's awesome. Well, thank you for being on. Thank you all for listening and uh, God bless you guys and have a good week.